A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the daily Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy. Today I am going to cover 8 different news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 21st December 2022 and displayed here are a list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. You can go through it. Now without any delay let us get into the article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article here talks about the famous Theosophical Society. It says that 147th International Convention of the Theosophical Society is about to be held at its headquarters which is in Adyar Chennai and this is the crux of the news article given here. See Theosophical Society is very important for you from prelims point of view and also its functions and roles which falls under the topic socio-religious reform movements are important from mains perspective. So pay attention to the discussion. Now let us start by understanding what the Theosophical Society is all about. See it all started when a group of westerners led by Madame A. H. P. Blavatsky and Colonel M. S. Alcott who were inspired by Indian thought and culture. They founded the Theosophical Society in the New York City in 1875. Later in 1882 they shifted the headquarters of Theosophical Society to Adyar in Chennai. See the society had a belief that a special relation could be established between a person's soul and God. And this is by contemplation, prayer and revelation. Now it is important to note here that they accepted the Hindu beliefs of reincarnation and karma. Also they took inspiration from the philosophy of Upanishads, Yoga and also from Vedanta school of thoughts. This is a brief about Theosophical Society. Now what was the role of Theosophical Society? See Theosophical Society aimed to work towards universal brotherhood without any distinction of race, creed, sex or caste. Then Theosophical Society soon became associated with the Hindu Renaissance. Because of this the society opposed child marriage and advocated the abolition of caste based discrimination. The society also worked for the cause of widows. Despite its social works it was not very popular until Annie Besant took over as president in 1907. As we all know thereafter the Theosophical Society is actively involved in Indian independence movement. This is about role. Now talking about the drawbacks of Theosophical Society, see the major drawback of the society was that the society fulfilled the urges of the educated Hindus only. That is its impact was felt only on a small segment of westernized class and an average Indian did not gain much out of its actions. However, as a revivalist movement it gave Indians the pride and self-respect to fight against the colonial rulers. So this is about the Theosophical Society and its significance and have a tab for this when you prepare the topics under socio-religious reform movement. This is all regarding this news article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the Theosophical Society and some of its roles and finally about drawbacks of Theosophical Society. As I mentioned earlier this topic is very important for your both prelims and mains exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article. Now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article talks about genome sequencing. It says that India's health ministry has asked the states to boost the genome sequencing of the virus samples. See the genome sequencing is done to track variants of virus through the Indian SARS-CoV-2 genomics consortium network. See the genome sequencing is essential because of the increase in the coronavirus cases in China, USA and South Korea. India has also been reporting around 1200 cases a week. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context let us understand about genome sequencing then how it is done and finally we will see some of the benefits of genome sequencing. But before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here kindly go through it. Now first let us start with basics. What is DNA? See it is expanded as deoxyribonucleic acid. It is the material that exists in every cell in the body that holds genetic code and know that four chemical bases make up the DNA. It includes adenine, cytosine, thymine and guanine and this is about the DNA. Now what is gene? See gene is nothing but the basic unit of heredity which is passed from parent to the child. See genes are made up of sequences of DNA. So a segment of DNA is called as gene and these gene only contain information for making specific proteins and these proteins led to the expression of a particular physical characteristic or trait such as hair color or eye color etc. 
Now look at this image. It will give you better understanding. See the sequences of bases here. It is only DNA. See sequencing is nothing but arranging in a particular order. So the four bases are arranged in certain order and these sequences form DNA and a particular segment of DNA is called as gene. As we already saw this gene only contains information for making specific proteins which in turn decides the physical characteristics. Let us imagine something here. Let us assume that pink region here holds gene for the hair color. So this means that this segment only will decide whether the person will get black or brown or blonde hair. I hope now you understand what is DNA and what is gene. Now let's see what is genome. See the genome is the entire set of DNA instructions found in a cell. As we all know humans consist of 23 pairs of chromosomes. Here one chromosome from each parent will make a pair. Apart from this we also have small chromosome in the cell's mitochondria and all of this together is called genome. So a genome contains all the information needed for an individual to develop and function. So it is like a recipe book for making our body. Now let us come to genome sequencing. So what is this genome sequencing? See we already saw that genome consists of chromosomes then chromosome consists of DNA and DNA consists of four bases. And we also saw that these bases will be arranged in a specific order. So the process of finding out the order of DNA bases in the genome is only called genome sequencing. Now you may ask why should we find the order of the bases in the genome? Earlier we saw that genome contains all the information needed for an individual to develop and function, right? So if you find the sequence of the genome, then it will be easy for us to identify the unique DNA fingerprint or pattern of the organism. In simple words, we will be able to understand about a organism fully. Why certain organism behaves certain way or how it reproduces or how it causes disease. All these questions will be answered if we find out the sequence of the genome. Because it is the genome which holds information for developing the organism and its functioning. And that is why in the article India is boosting the genome sequencing of COVID virus. And this is to understand COVID virus fully so that we can curb its spread, right? This is all about genome sequencing. Now let's see some of the benefits of genome sequencing. The first benefit is the potential medical implication. See genome sequencing can provide information on genetic variants that leads to disease. Then the second benefit is in the field of drug delivery. See genome sequencing helps in obtaining information regarding drug efficacy or adverse effect of drug use. And for your information know that the relationship between drugs and the genome is called pharmacogenomics. Then the third benefit is in the field of archaeology. We have read several times in the newspaper regarding genome sequencing of archaeological specimens right and the genome sequencing will give us information about the physical characteristics of our ancestors and then genetic mutations etc. And the final benefit is the cost effectiveness. See once a genome is decoded it becomes a multi-generational repository of information and this decoded genome will prevent the errors in the diagnosis of disease and the treatment. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what is DNA, then what is gene and then what is genome and then we saw about what is genome sequencing and finally we saw some of the benefits of genome sequencing. See this type of science and tech topics are very very important for your both prelims and mains exam because this type of concepts are frequently asked in UPSC exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed in the article. Now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this editorial article here, it talks about the issue of ensuring independence of integrity institutions in India, particularly Election Commission of India. See this editorial article is written in the context of Supreme Court of India hearing a case relating to the appointment of Election Commissioner of India. This article further stresses the need for ensuring a sound appointment strategy for integrity institutions. And this is the crux of the article given here. Now in this discussion we will see what is mean by integrity institutions. Then why is it necessary to ensure independence of the integrity institutions. Now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. Now firstly coming to the term integrity institutions. See the author of the article terms certain government institutions in a country as integrity institutions. Due to the fact that these institutions are so crucial for functioning of democracy. The author further says that these institutions can also be called as fourth pillar of democracy. Now the examples of integrated institutions found in India are 
election commission of india comptroller and auditor general the public service commissions and the national commission for scheduled caste scheduled tribes etc now coming particularly to election commission of india see there are numerous safeguards for ensuring the independence of election commission of india as we all know the election commission conducts elections to the sum of highest offices in our country now let's see some of the safeguards provided by our constitution to ensure the independence of election commission of india see article 324 class 5 says that chief election commissioner of india shall not be removed from his office except in a manner like judge of the supreme court what this says is the constitution is safeguarding chief election commissioner and this ensures independence of election commission of india the constitution also says that the conditions of service of the chief election commissioner shall not be varied to his disadvantage after his appointment see this point also tries to safeguard the independence of election commission of india here also note that the expenses of election commission of india is charged on the consolidated fund of india it means that government of india cannot curtail the expenses of election commission of india according to its whims and fancies so this also safeguards the independence of election commission of india also election commission of india has complete authority on how where and when to conduct an election without any interference from the executive so this also ensures the independence of election commission of india see these are all some of the constitutional safeguards provided for the election commission of india to ensure its independence now talking about the issues pertaining to the autonomy of election commission of india see the appointment mechanism of chief election commissioner and election commissioners are solely within the domain of executives in india as we all know chief election commissioner and election commissioners are appointed by the president of india in consultation with the council of ministers see this is one of the main challenge for the autonomy of election commission of india now coming to the article the author of the article brings in an observation of south african constitutional court see the south african court said true and functional independence is effectively impossible if the power to appoint rests entirely with a single individual officer entity see this is particularly true in the case of india since executive are the sole appointing agency for chief election commissioner and election commissioners so this will ultimately lead to the erosion of independence of election commission of india and another major issue with the election commission is the constitution does not debar the retiring election commissioner for any further appointment by the government see it gives the government a chance to reappoint particular election commissioner to any other government post or to election commission itself so the election commissioner may lean to the government's actions because he is reappointed by the government so it also affects the independence of election commission of india and thirdly only chief election commissioner has a security of tenure while the other two election commissioners can be removed with the approval of chief election commissioner see this is a serious concern which leaves the other two election commissioners without a security of tenure so this also affects the independence of election commission of india see these are all some of the issues associated with election commission of india which is presently there now finally let's see a few solutions for this problems firstly there should be a mechanism to look into appointment process here comes the vinith narayanan case becomes important see supreme court in the case held that cbi directors appointment must be by a body consisting of the prime minister the leader of opposition and the chief justice of india so the author of the article opines that this type of appointment process will also be followed in the appointment of election commissioners and chief election commissioner to the election commission of india and this will bring independence to election commission of india other than this election commissioners service conditions can be brought on par with the chief election commissioner and this will help them perform without fear and the author of the article ends the discussion by saying that the supreme court need to spell out interim orders regarding the appointment of election commissioner and chief election commissioners and the author also says that the court should leave the permanent structural solution to the legislature and this is all about what is discussed in this article and we have come to end of this discussion and through this discussion we saw about what are integrity institutions and also we saw about what are the safeguards in the constitution for election commission of india then we saw about what are the issues affecting the independence of election commission of india and finally we saw about some of the solutions to solve the issues see this article is very important for your mains examination because this topic is frequently coming in news so we may expect a mains question regarding independence of election commission of india so make note of each and every points that we discussed in the article and you can also use this points in your mains answer and that's all regarding this article now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion
Now have a look at this news article. This news article here talks about the State Human Rights Commission. See, the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister has recommended the names of former High Court judges to be appointed as members of State Human Rights Commission. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this regard, we will learn about the State Human Rights Commission as it is important from your mains and prelims perspective. Now let's start by understanding about the State Human Rights Commission. See, the State Human Rights Commission was established in states under the provisions of Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. So it is a statutory body and not a constitutional body. Remember this fact and note on point here, the State Human Rights Commission can inquire into violation of human rights only in respect of subjects mentioned in the state list and the concurrent list of sound schedule. Now coming to its composition, see the State Human Rights Commission is a multi-member body. It consisting of chairperson and two members. Know that the chairperson of the body shall be a retired Chief Justice of a High Court or a High Court Judge. Now coming to the members, the member should be serving a retired High Court Judge or a District Judge with 7 years of experience. Now you may think how they are appointed. Know that the chairperson and the members of State Human Rights Commission are appointed by the Governor of the respective states. They are appointed based on the recommendations made by a committee. Here the members of the committee include the Chief Minister who also act as the head of the committee and the Speaker of particular State Legislative Assembly. Now talking about the tenure of the chairperson and members, see the chairperson and the members hold the office for a term of 3 years or until they attain the age of 70. An important point to note here is that although the appointment of chairperson and the members is done by the Governor, their removal is in the hands of President. So, they are appointed by Governor but they are removed only by the President. And this is all about State Human Rights Commission. Now, we will see some of the important functions of State Human Rights Commission. Firstly, the Commission inquires into any violation of human rights by a public servant. It can also take up cases by CO moto or by a petition or by a court order. This is the first foremost function of State Human Rights Commission. Secondly, it can intervene in any proceedings involving allegations of violation of human rights pending before a court. Then thirdly, the Commission can even visit jails and detention places to study about the living conditions of prisoners. Then fourthly, the Commission can also review the constitutional and other legal safeguards for the protection of human rights. And fifthly, the Commission can review the factors including acts of terrorism and recommend remedial measures. And sixthly, they can even undertake research projects in the field of human rights. And finally, the Commission also works to promote literacy among the people and they also create awareness of the safeguards available for the protection of human rights. See, these are all some of the major functions of State Human Rights Commission. And have a tab for this when you read important statutory bodies. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about State Human Rights Commission, its composition, then the tenure and the appointment of chairperson and the members. And finally we saw about some of the important functions of State Human Rights Commission. See this topic is very important in the aspect of both prelims and mains. So make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this news article here. This news article talks about a discussion that happened in Raj Shabha. See this discussion was happened when the government attempted to move two appropriation bills. Although the debate from the article is not that important, here we should learn about the appropriation bill as it becomes relevant from the prelims perspective under the topic Indian polity and governance. And from mains perspective, it comes under GS paper 2 in the topic functions and responsibilities of the union and the state. So now we will see what an appropriation bill is all about. See to put simply, when an appropriation bill is passed, it means that the central government can withdraw funds from the Consolidated Fund of India. As we all know that the budget proposal happens before every financial year. So post this budget discussions and the voting on demand for grants, the government introduces the appropriation bill in the Lok Sabha. What appropriation bill does is that it basically gives authority to the government to withdraw fund from the Consolidated Fund of India. See the article 114 class 3 of the constitution says that no amount can be withdrawn from the Consolidated Fund without the enactment of such law by the parliament. So to give effect to this article only the appropriation bill is being introduced in the Lok Sabha. Note that no amendment can be proposed to an appropriation bill which will have the effect of varying the amount 
or altering the destination of any grant made or of varying the amount of any expenditure charged on the consolidated fund of India. Okay, and this is about the appropriation bill. Now we will see the procedure on how it is passed. We all know that when the budget is presented, there would be discussions. Following this, the budget proposal is scrutinized by various committees of the parliament. Then there would be voting on demand for grants. And after the voting on demand for grants, the government introduces the appropriation bill in the Lok Sabha. And it has to be passed by the Lok Sabha. Then it is sent to the Raj Sabha. See in this regard, the Raj Sabha can only make recommendations. And it is the will of Lok Sabha to either accept or reject the recommendations made by Raj Sabha. And finally, once the bill passed by both Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha, then it is sent to the president for his or her assent. And after the assent of the president, the government appropriates funds from the Consolidated Fund of India. And this is all about the process on which the appropriation bill is passed. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is appropriation bill, then the procedure involved in the passing of appropriation bill. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article. It reports that Gujarat's Vadnagar town, then the Sun Temple at Modera, and the rock cut sculptures of Unakoti in Tiripura have been added to the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This article further gives some specific details about all the three sites. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. But before getting into discussion, we will briefly see about UNESCO. See, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is shortly known as UNESCO, is a specialized agency functioning under the United Nations. See, it aims to provide world peace and security through international cooperation in education, arts, science and culture. Now with this background, let's learn about UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. See, a World Heritage Site is a landmark or an area with legal protection by an international convention administered by UNESCO. See, World Heritage Sites are designated by UNESCO for having cultural, historical, scientific and other forms of significance. Now coming to the different types of sites which are recognized by UNESCO. See there are three different sites recognized by UNESCO. They are cultural, natural and mixed sites. Here cultural sites are those which have some sort of cultural importance. Then natural sites are those which have some sort of geographical importance. Now coming to the mixed sites. The mixed sites are those which have both cultural and geographical importance. This is about the types. Now coming to India specific information. At present, there are 40 UNESCO World Heritage Sites in India. Among these 40 sites, 32 are cultural, 7 are natural and 1 is a mixed site. Here, the mixed site is none other than the Kanjanjunga National Park. This is about World Heritage Sites. Now, let's move on to see about tentative list of UNESCO. See, UNESCO maintains a tentative list of sites from which the heritage sites are finally chosen. From the tentative list, the sites can be nominated to attain World Heritage Site Status. Here note that the residing authority who can include sites into World Heritage List is a committee called World Heritage Committee. Know that the committee consists of members from 21 countries and they are elected by General Assembly of State Parties for a four-year term. This is about World Heritage Committee. Now coming to the news article, it says that India has added three sites to the tentative list. As we saw earlier, Two sites are located in state of Gujarat and one site is located in state of Tirupura. Now first let's take Unakoti. See Unakoti is the site which is located in Tirupura is also known as Angkor Wat of northeastern India. Know that huge rock cut sculptures are present here. Also know that the Unakoti is an ancient holy place associated with Shaiva worship. This site is located in a forest area displaying a number of towering low relief images in a unique style. So, it making it a masterpiece of human creative genius. Now, coming to the other sites, the Vadnagar town has been added to the list due to its historical importance. See, it is said to be a multi-layered historic town with history stretching back to nearly 8th century BC. And coming to the final site, see, it is about Modera Sun Temple. See, it is dedicated to the sun god and it is the earliest of such temples which set trends in architectural and decorative details. Here note that this temple represents the regional architecture of Solanki style. And this is all about the three sites which are recently added to the tentative list. 
and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about unesco then unesco's world heritage sites then about three types of world heritage sites and then we saw about the tentative list of unesco and finally we saw in brief about the three sites that have recently added to tentative list of unesco world heritage site see this topic is very important for your prelims exam so try to remember the sites and that's all regarding this discussion now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this text and context page article this article talks about the new global biodiversity framework that is kunming montreal global biodiversity framework for better understanding about this framework we have to first learn about convention on biological diversity see the convention on biological diversity which is shortly known as cbd is the international legal instrument of the united nations and this convention is for the conservation of biological diversity the convention will also look into the sustainable use of biological components and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of utilization of genetic resources so the overall objective of convention on biological diversity is to encourage actions which will lead to sustainable future know that the cbd has been ratified by 196 nations the cbd's governing body is the conference of the parties this means that conference of parties is the decision making body remember the secretariat of cbd is located in montreal canada now coming back to the news article this article says that recently the convention on biological diversity got a boost at a conference held in montreal see 188 out of 196 members of convention on biological diversity agreed on a new framework that is kunming montreal global biodiversity framework to put simply the new framework is providing boost to the convention on biological diversity see this framework aims to halt the sharp and steady loss of biological species note that this biological framework has got support from united states and the vatican despite they are not party to the convention on biological diversity and this is the crux of the text and context article given here now in this context let us discuss about the kunming montreal global biodiversity framework but before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here kindly go through it now first let's start with what is biodiversity see biological diversity which is shortly known as biodiversity is the variety of life on earth in all its forms that is from genes and bacteria to entire ecosystems such as forests or coral reefs now coming to the question is biodiversity very important yes of course see biological diversity is necessary to sustain the balance of ecosystems then biodiversity also enables the humans to coexist with nature then the services rendered by diverse living forms such as plants and animals are most visible here the ecosystem services include providing humans with food fuel fiber shelter building materials etc then the ecosystem also purifies air and water then it stabilizes climate and it also moderates the effect of flood drought extreme temperatures and wind see if these services are disrupted there will be severe impacts such as failed agriculture aberrant climate patterns and cascading loss of species and this also accelerates the degradation of earth so we can say that the biodiversity is our strongest natural defense against climate change now with this basic understanding let's see about kunming montreal global biodiversity framework see as i already said this framework is a boost to the convention on biological diversity know that this framework has 23 targets that the world needs to achieve it by 2030 and targets are ambitious because it is considered that biodiversity is in poor state see i am not going to discuss all the 23 targets now i will tell you important targets alone as mentioned in the news article firstly the framework targets for the production of degraded areas then it also provides for resource mobilization for conservation and compensation for countries that preserve biodiversity then the framework even targets halting human activity linked to species extinction and it also aims to reduce the spread of invasive alien species by half here you have to note that the framework goals and targets do not prohibit the use of biodiversity but it calls for sustainable use okay then the framework emphasizes the respect for the rights of indigenous communities who traditionally protect forests and biodiversity in overall it ensures human coexistence with nature 
see these are all some of the targets of kunming montreal global biodiversity framework now coming to the another question will these targets be achieved see this question arises because earlier the convention on biological diversity had launched the ig biodiversity targets for 2020 this included safeguarding of all ecosystems that provide services for humanity's survival the ig targets also include the nagoya protocol see the nagoya protocol was created to ensure sharing of biodiversity assets and benefits but what happened to this ig targets see the ig biodiversity targets were not met so to prevent this type of failure the kunming montreal global biodiversity framework points out that the member nations need to submit a revised and updated national biodiversity strategy and action plan and it has to be done in the 2024 conference further the parties to the convention on biological diversity should submit national reports in 2026 and 2029 respectively see this will help to prepare global reviews and the framework also points out that even business and industry would have to assess monitor and report the risks and impacts of their operations and portfolios and when we talk about the funding the kunming montreal global biodiversity framework hopes to see at least 200 billion us dollars to be raised per year and this is from all sources such as domestic international public and private then in terms of international funding developing countries should get at least 20 billion us dollars a year and this is by 2025 and at least 30 billion us dollars by 2030 now how the developing countries will get funds see they get funds through contributions from developed countries for this funding mechanism the global environment facility which is a multilateral body has been tasked to establish a special trust fund and this fund will helps in implementation of kunming montreal global biodiversity framework then the global biodiversity framework is also aligned with united nations sustainable development goals see i have given what are all the sustainable development goals that are needed to be achieved by global biodiversity framework you can just go through it see overall the kunming montreal global biodiversity framework is going to be a framework that ensures achievement of sustainable development goals in all its three dimensions that is environmental social and economic dimensions and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about conventional biological diversity then about biodiversity and we saw in detail about kunming montreal global biodiversity framework then some of its targets and finally we saw about funding pattern of the global biodiversity framework see this topic is very important in the aspect of mains examination so make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article talks about the delivery of submarine wagir see this submarine is the fifth scorpion class conventional submarine made under project 75 of indian navy and this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us learn about scorpion class conventional submarines of india see first of all what is a submarine see submarine is a naval vessel that is capable of propelling itself beneath the water as well as on the water surface now coming to the scorpion class conventional submarines see the scorpion class submarines are one of the most advanced conventional submarines in the world these submarines has superior stealth features for example it has advanced acoustic silencing techniques then low radiated noise levels and it has the ability to attack with precision guided weapons on board now what is the purpose of these submarines see the indian navy intends to use the submarines for missions like area surveillance then intelligence gathering anti submarine warfare anti surface warfare and mine laying operations know that these submarines are armed with six torpedo launching tubes then 18 heavy weapons then tube launched anti ship missiles and precision guided weapons then it can also launch crippling attacks on surface and underwater enemy targets moreover the attack submarines can travel at a maximum submerged speed of approximately 2 knots and they also have the ability to remain submerged for 21 days and know that it has a diving depth of more than 350 meters now who designed these submarines see these scorpion class submarines are being constructed at masagon dock ship builders limited in mumbai and it is under collaboration with french naval group okay this is under technology transfer from the naval group of france remember the submarine is part of indian navy's project 75 
and the first submarine under this project was commissioned into the navy in december 2017 at present the navy has four submarines from this project firstly ins kalwari then ins kandayari and both were commissioned in september 2019 and thirdly ins karnaj which was commissioned in march 2021 and the fourth one ins vela which was commissioned in november 2021 and now the fifth one that is ins vagir is scheduled to be commissioned to service in january 2023 and know that the sixth that is ins vakshir was launched into water in april 2022 and it is expected to be delivered to the navy by 2023 end okay also know that the navy has drawn up plans to install air independent propulsion modules on all scorpion submarines now what is mean by this air independent propulsion modules see this technology enhances the underwater endurance and stealth of conventional submarines this means that the submarines need not to come onto the surface often for oxygen to recharge their batteries okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is submarine then about scorpion class submarines and we also saw about the purpose of the scorpion class submarines and we also saw about project 75 of the indian navy and finally we saw about what is air independent propulsion modules and that's all regarding this discussion with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question this question is regarding theosophical society now let's take up the first statement Annie Besant was the founding member of the Theosophical Society. See this statement is wrong because the Theosophical Society was founded by Madam A. H. P. Blavatsky and Colonel M. S. Alcott and it was founded in the New York City in 1875. So statement 1 is wrong. Now coming to the second statement, it rejected the Hindu beliefs of reincarnation and karma. See this statement is also wrong because as we saw in the discussion the society accepted the hindu beliefs of reincarnation and karma also they took inspiration from the philosophy of upanishads and yoga so statement 2 is also wrong now the question is asking for incorrect statement so in the question both statements are incorrect so the correct answer for the question is option c both 1 and 2 moving on now let's take up the second question see this question is a previous question and it was asked in prelims 2021 now i will read out the question Which one of the following ancient towns is well known for its elaborate system of water harvesting and management by building a series of dams and channelizing water into connector reservoirs? See here the correct answer is option A, Dolavira. See Dolavira is a Harappan era archaeological site present in Kutch region of Gujarat. See Dolavira was included in UNESCO's list of world heritage sites in the month of July 2021 and this is why the question was asked in the prelims that year. See the excavations from Dolavira provides us the example for ancient water harvesting system. That's why the question is regarding water harvesting and water management. So the correct answer is option A, Dolavira. Now moving on, let's take up the final question. Which among the following options is incorrect? Here four options are given. We have to choose which option is incorrect. Now let's take up the first option. Project 75 of the Indian Navy is a step towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. Yes, option A is correct. See all submarines under project 75 are built in India so it promotes atmanirbhar bharat so option 1 is correct now coming to the option b project 75 envisages six scorpion class conventional submarines see this option is also correct see project 75 envisages six scorpion class submarines and they are ins kalwari ins kandheri ins karnaj ins vela ins vagir and the last one ins vakshir So option B is also correct. Now coming to the option C, the first scorpion class conventional submarine is named Vagir. See this statement is incorrect because the first submarine under project 75 is INS Kalwari and not INS Vagir. So this option only incorrect. Now we also need to check whether fourth option is right or wrong. Project 75 has technology transfer from the naval group of France. This we saw in discussion itself. Under Project 75, the submarines are made with the help of technology transfer from France. So the correct answer for the question is option C. The first Scorpion class conventional submarine is named Vagir. Here, INS Kalwar is the first submarine. So option C is incorrect. And displayed here is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. 
and displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this we came to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share and do not forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayas Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.